Good morning, church family. How are you guys this morning? Good to see everybody out there. Uh, looks like the Lord has blessed us with another good day. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Scott Blue. I'm the chair of the trustees. Uh, obviously, I'm not Austin. I got better hair than Austin, so we'll go from there. But I do want to take a moment just to kind of introduce all the trustees out there so you guys can get an idea of who who your trustees are and give you an idea of what we do as a for the church. So if, uh, if I call your name, just raise your hand. Doyle Burkholder, he's in the back of the sound booth. We have Charlie Brown, he's out, out front there kind of watching over security and stuff. He's in Florida today. Oh, so he stuck off on me, didn't he? Uh -huh. Got to get a hold of him. Uh, ben Irvin is another one of our trustees. Gary Suffin. Dick Weigel, Randy Maldad, and John Simon. Uh, these are your trustees, and what are some of our responsibilities as trustees is, again, maintaining the grounds of this facility, maintaining the building, make sure uh, uh, everything's operating and functioning as it should. Uh, obviously, we are in charge of any building projects, anything going on in the church, uh, approving different things as well plus security loans for the church. So, you know, if you see something that needs uh, attention that we have not caught, if you want to drop us a note, get a hold of one of us, we'd be more than happy to listen to it and see what we can do to take care of that. Okay? Uh, continuing uh, with announcements, first and foremost, uh, for those of you last week who didn't show up for the Super Bowl party, you guys missed a great talk. We had several uh, pots of soup back here. We had good fellowship. Uh, I want to thank the Rec Rec Recreation uh, Committee, that'd be Carol, Neal, uh, Ron Ward, Susan Gardner, Jim Brent, and Don Stiles. They did a fantastic job for us back there. We really appreciate that. Uh, looking at your bulletin for your announcements today, just real quick, things you want to keep in mind. You know, the prayer list there, uh, make sure you kind of look at it. You might want to send those people a card, just let them know that you're thinking about them. Uh, again, uh, Looking at there's some birthday anniversaries in there. Donations, uh, again, Good Samaritan Center, they're looking for this month for pudding mixes, next month, a uh, box of potatoes, and April hamburger helper. So if you can provide any of that for them, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, again, we're always looking for volunteers, whether it be in the nursery, uh, you know, I always use help back here. Uh, anybody would like to join the cleaning crew, and, you know, this is a big church where it takes a lot of people to take this place to keep it clean. So, again, um, if you can help out in that in any way, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, just one other thing I want to touch on, too, as far as nursery goes. We have a, a new schedule out for nursery, and it's not like published and hanging up anywhere yet, but you'll see the changes reflected in the bulletin. Um, and I'll get I'll get it printed out for the next couple months, and I'll have it here next Sunday. Um, I'll hang a copy in the nursery as well. Um, so if you can take a look at that and just let me know if there's any issues with it or if you need any changes, uh, I can address that as well. Um, one other thing that is in your bulletin too uh, is there's this Engaging Mental Health with Hope Conference. I know Carrie and I have kind of talked about it a little bit. Uh, we learned a little bit about it uh, when we were at our, our annual training event. Uh, but it sounds like it's a really good opportunity to, to go and talk about some of the challenges that uh, are affecting. And I don't remember if it's like, is it teen focused or is it adult focused? Both, I don't remember. Do you remember here? Yeah, I think it's more teen focused, uh, but, but just some of the challenges that, that, that we face in, in the world and with technology and things of that nature. Um, and then there's the bird breakfast. Uh, Dr. David, he, he informed me that this was the one to go to because his wife was cooking. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that pretty much uh, wraps up our, our uh, morning announcements. Um, so, without further ado, this morning, if you've noticed, 
All of our song leaders are gone. And so this has left this void in which we had no idea how to fill. And I jokingly said, Troy, if you need somebody to lead congregational singing, I'll take care of it. And then he says, are you serious? Because I need somebody to lead congregational singing. And thank goodness, Katie is going to be up here as well, because you guys do not just want to hear me to lead congregational singing. So let's pray real quick, and then we'll get into our first hymn. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for this uh, beautiful day that we can gather here to fellowship with one another, and God, most importantly, to worship you. And God, I just pray that our hearts and our minds are fixed on you this morning. Uh, Lord, as we sing these songs, as we go through ministry of prayer, uh, Lord, as, as Dr. Carrico brings our message this morning, God, I pray that our hearts and minds are fixed on you. Uh, Lord, I just thank you, we praise you, and we love you. Amen. So our first hymn is Sanctuary, that's 655. So if you all will stand, let's sing together and have a joyful sound song to the Lord.
appreciate Katie, so you guys didn't just have to hear me. And so I've been tasked with our, our ministry of prayer this morning, and um, it was kind of interesting this week. Uh, I had watched this like brief, like two minute long video, and uh, what the guy had talked about and discussed, I thought was really cool. I was like, what a cool message, uh, what a cool visual. Um, and then the next day, Troy says, we do ministry of prayer. I'm like, maybe that's the Lord telling me this is what we need to do ministry of prayer about. And so I'm just going to start by reading you some scripture out of uh, the book of Luke. Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. It reads, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, and what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap, they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are and so, what this video said, I'm going to try to, to remember all the words and tell you just like the video, because that's probably why it was didn't mean to get up here. So, this guy says, he doesn't know if this story was a true story or not, uh, but it was some, something someone had told him, and he said there was a widow, and she didn't have a lot to her name, she was hungry, and for days she was praying, God, fill my pantry, God, fill my pantry, and she kept praying that prayer over and over and over again. Praying that the Lord would give her food and bless her in that way. And the next day she heard a, a ring at her doorbell. And she went out and she opened the door. And on her stoop was all this food. Enough to fill her entire pantry. And she said, God did it. God took care of me. God's going to fill my pantry. And she heard this guy in the bushes. He was laughing. And, and he was her neighbor. And he came out and he said, he said, I'm an atheist. But I heard you praying. And I went to the store and I bought all this food and I brought it here to your doorstep. And I came to watch you praise the God that doesn't exist. And she said, yeah, but God didn't. And he said, no, no, you don't understand what I'm saying. He said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. He said, I heard you pray your prayer. I heard it. And I got in my car and I drove to the store and I used my credit card and I bought you food. I drove it back over here. I put it on your doorstep. I rang your doorbell. And she said, but God did. And he made the devil pay for it. <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty cool story and uh, you know I think that's why it's so important that, that we really listen to God like we truly listen you know it's so easy for us to, to talk to pray and to ask for things uh, but you know we just never really know how God's going to answer our prayers and, you know I personally like if I pray a prayer of the need I have I want this big revelation I don't want there to be any question that God provided for but sometimes it happens in ways maybe we're not looking for, uh, things we don't expect. Uh, in a situation like that, she was told, no, God didn't do this, but she saw through that. Right? So how many times do we, without even being told it's not God, just assume it's not God or a coincidence or something like that? Uh, you know, we get too distracted to, to see the big picture, to see how God will use ordinary people, sometimes even unexpected ones, uh, to, to answer our prayers. And not only that, but if God can use someone else to impact your life, that means God can use you to impact someone else's life. Uh, and, and that's just, it's really important for us to, to pay attention to that. Uh, and so, you know, God, he, he is constantly at work. He's constantly at work in, in my life, in your life, in, in your neighbor's life. God's at work. And I think we have the opportunity this week, as with every week in, in upcoming, to, to be that light to someone else. And to be exactly what that person is praying for. And so I want to read one more scripture this morning. Uh, this was actually the one, if Troy sent me his correct notes, this is one he used last week. And I thought, I'm going to use that one again as well. So it's Philippians 4, 6. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And so, there's just one more thing I want to briefly chat about before I uh, turn it back over to Katie for special music. Uh, does anybody here, maybe by like show of hands, you guys know what's happening in Kentucky? Anybody familiar? So, I see a few hands going on. And so, there's this big revival going on at, at Ashbury University in Kentucky. And so, I just, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I wanted to read this quote to you from a news article I 
just to kind of make you guys aware of, of kind of what's, what's happening. Uh, it says, during the call to confession last Wednesday, February 8th, at least 100 people fell to their knees. They bowed at the altar. And since then, it has turned into a Holy Spirit outpouring that shows no signs of stopping. For days, people have been giving testimonies, reading scripture, worshiping God, and praying in the ongoing revival. Students, professors, and local church leaders have taken part. Now, I, I really don't know a lot about what's, what's happening. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I've not been there. I've not, I've not watched or read enough about it. But I think there's something that, that we can take from this as well. And that is, it's something we better know really good, and that's God. He's not done working. Right? He is silent. We're not forgotten. He isn't done changing lives and offering re 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 um, getting tongue twisted. <laughs> offering redemption. Right? God's not done saving the, the alcoholic and, and the drug addict. Right? He's not done saving the person who's uh, facing whatever type of immorality or adultery or, or idolatry. Uh, God's not done restoring those people from their sinful states to where they are now. The Holy Spirit's at work. And in fact, this morning, right here in this place, as we gather, as we worship and we fellowship, the Holy Spirit is right here at work. He's here just as well. And so the only question that I want to kind of leave you guys with is this, and really it's kind of a multi-part question because I have a bunch of them. But it's when, it's basically this, is how will you let the Holy Spirit in? How will you worship when we change up who's in the pulpit? How will you worship when I get volunteer to do special music? Or to the congregational singing. And thank goodness for Katie for that. But how will you worship? How will you worship when a kid shouts during the prayer? How will that change your worship? When you feel overwhelmed and you just want to fall to your knees, how will that change your worship? So how will you worship? What don't you think about that this morning? This, was, this revival started with some folks who were really on fire, worshiping the Lord together. And so just as a kind of a final question and final thought, for you is how we worship. And so I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward to, to receive our, our morning's offering. Um, and as they do, this is just one avenue that we have to worship God. Right? We can take part of what He's given us, what He's blessed us with, and we can give it back to Him. And so, and we can do that generously and humbly here this morning as we start our worship. Bless these tithes and offerings today, God. 
Let your light guide us. Let your compassion be the love that inspires us. And let your presence be the will that empowers us. Lord, guide our hearts as we seek to use our time and our talents and, and our treasures, God, according to your will. In your name we pray. Amen. talking about that 
and looking into this, just a few words, because they're very important words, because they ask a very important question about who do we think Christ really is. Now Jesus and his disciples went out of the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, others say one of the prophets. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should not tell anybody about him. Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our blessed Redeemer. Amen. It's good to see you today. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you. And that's something that's very important. I think so many times we forget to say thank you to you. I mean, you're the ones who come here and put up with us. And uh, I know uh, sometimes that becomes a little difficult, but you're here today, and I appreciate it a great deal. Gives Troy a chance to get away, and that's important as well. And uh, you always give your pastor a chance to rest. I uh, noticed, though, that he left. Katie's here. Terry's here. But he left. And it's important to, to understand that as well. You know, your life changes when you retire. And I guess I have come to understand what retirement really is. Uh, twice the time, half the money, you know. But uh, also, it, your life just revolves around different things. And uh, my wife's so busy at First Baptist, and she does a wonderful job there. And she just finished up as moderator. And uh, we're getting that church back on the right track. And I'm excited about it. I remember not too long ago, we would go there, and there would be 50 or 60 people there. And now we're averaging around 100. And we've baptized around 20? I think 27 so far. 27? Since last April. We just keep baptizing. And that's why the water bill is what it is. But that's OK. I'm a trustee. I just have to worry about paying for things. But, uh, it's good to see the outpouring of the Spirit. And you have to remember, First Baptist Church does not have a pastor. We can't find a booger. Yeah, he's out there somewhere. And we'll find him when the Lord provides. And that's important. But my life right now revolves around uh, Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. I know some of you don't know anything about that. Uh, I do work in gun smoke. I love gun smoke. But uh, it's important. I didn't realize those programs existed, daytime television. But uh, I'm starting to understand more and more about daytime television. And uh, now the XFL football week started last night. And uh, we never give up on football. There's always another person out there playing. So that'll give me something to do. Um, so we're looking at this narrative today. And uh, we need to understand that Jesus is out there walking with his disciples. Jesus did a lot of teaching when he walked with his disciples. There's something very important that happens when you walk with your people, walk with your disciples. And uh, there's a couple of people in this room that walk together all the time. And that's important and that's good. I, I cheer them on. And uh, I love when they go out of the house. Good job, honey. Keep you know, that's important. I'm not a walker. I'm hard enough to stand, but uh, it's kind of interesting to see what happens to you as you do that. And so he's out. He did a great deal of teaching at this time. And so he was reminding them of what the important things of his life was. Now, you got to remember, Jesus didn't travel more than 100 miles from where he was born. So he didn't go a long ways. But he went in important ways, and that's what we need to understand. We need to understand the towns of Caesarea Philippi were just kind of different places. They were small, but yet important. And uh, Herod thought they were important as well. And there he built palaces and really wanted to make it a kind of an important place for his life. And there was all kinds of things going on. But uh, Jesus went ahead and questioned them. He wanted to know who people thought and what they thought of him. 
because in doing that, you start understanding some very important things. Now, originally, when we start thinking about the disciples and the fishermen and things like that, we think to ourselves, jeepers, they were just ignorant fishermen. But if you look at these words, you know, in verse 28, and they said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say one of the problem. They weren't ignorant of the biblical people around them. He told them, he said, you know, some think that you're a prophet. Some think that you're Elijah. And so he, they revealed to him that their knowledge was not as limited as we think it is. And so he went on and talked to that, and he kind of went ahead and, and kind of pushed the whole envelope a little bit and reminded them about what they saw. Verse 29, but who do you say that I am? You see, there's a shift there, that those two verses. Wonder where, who do those people think I am? But then, who do you think that I am? When you start personalizing Christ, something happens. And, you know, it's kind of interesting when we deal with that. There's that personal confession of Christ, and that's powerful. And when it's personalized, it's saving. And that's what we're talking about today. The whole idea that they confronted him and they found out, again, who he was through that confession. Now, it was interesting. Austin was talking about the uh, revival that's going on in uh, Whitmore, Kentucky. And our granddaughter just went down there. And we haven't got a report back yet, but uh, I'm sure knowing Rebecca, we'll get a good one. But, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting. I was just reading an article last week saying that the United States is ripe for revival. And I think all of you will agree. The things going on in our nation, the things going on in our personal life, the things going on around the palace, in our communities, we're ripe for revival. You know, you, there's no use watching the news because it's always bad news. It's not fake news or false news. It's just bad news. And we have to make a difference. We make a difference through presenting the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, America is ready for revival. <clears throat> and this uh, revival that's going on Woodmore is just an old fashioned. You know, they, they get together and they, they pray and they sing, and, uh, you know, one group will win and they control it, so the next group will come in afterwards. And that's, that's very important. Okay, what do we break? Okay, that's good. You never know about those two back there. Well, you do, but we don't want to talk about it. Anyway, you know, I believe that, that social media helps us with that. In a lot of ways, you can find out about that, that, that revival going on in Whitmore, as you can read on social media. There's a marvelous thing going on. There's something that's going on of praying and singing. <coughs> Excuse me and the personalization of Christ. And that's exactly what's going on here in this verse. Uh, you know, he answered them and said, you are the Christ. You know, what a, what a, a, product, a personal proclamation of who Christ was. You are the Christ. Not someone else, but you. You are the Christ. And when that happens in our life, when we start realizing who Christ is and what Christ does. And all of a sudden, things change. And that's what's happening with these disciples. And that's what's happening not only with Peter, but with us. That's what happens in the church when we start realizing who Christ is. Not about Christ, but who he is. There's a lot of people that know about Christ. If you talk to someone and say, well, who's Jesus? I'll tell you all kinds of things. They'll tell you, well, I read this book, or I saw this movie, or I did this, or did They know a lot about Christ, but do they know Christ? And that's very important. So today, as we look at this, we need to start understanding that. What did I do, run you off? Oh, look at this. Troy has you so well trained. I can't wait till he gets back in town. Thank you, Terry. You know, we live in a very unusual time. And it's important that we start looking at our time, looking at how we're using that. 
Who do people say that I am? I know about Christ, but do you know Christ? There's a difference. And that difference is really the crux of this, this message today. Do you know Christ, who he is, and what he can do in your life, that he can change you? And that's important. You know, the, the older I get, the more I start realizing more and more about Christ. Not just reading the Bible and being with people. Not just being with people, but being with groups of people. And that's important. On Tuesday, of course, we have our gentlemen's group that meet down to the dog house and, and you know, have the fatted hot dog. But um, that's good. And that's important. But also, there's other groups out there. There's other groups that are making a difference, and we need to understand that. We need to understand there are people out there that are looking for things to be in fellowship with, and that's what we know about Christ. Um, at New Hope Baptist Church, we're going through a big change. We don't have a pastor. Uh, we have a lot of different people speaking, but all of them are good. And we have a lot of different types of music, and all of it's different and good. And uh, slowly I'm getting used to the guitars and the drums. It's slow, but I'm getting there, you know. Um, but it's important. It's important that we understand that change makes a difference. And I would ask you today, what kind of Christ are you portraying? When people think of New Hope Baptist Church, what do they think of? What kind of Christ do they see in your life? What kind of Christ do you make a difference? And that's always important. It's important because we show them what the church is. Not only the church personally, but the church to the community. And I'm still silly enough to believe that if we really understand Christ, we can make a difference in this community. That we can make a difference in people's lives. Not just talk about who they are, but who they can become. And that's the exciting part. When someone's life is changed, and in these towns of Caesarea Philippi, we do this personal confection, and all of a sudden things are different, and they understand they're changing people's lives. The concept of the Messiah is very loaded, though. It's a concept that has a different, a lot of different meanings. It's a concept that challenges you, and that's why in verse thirty it says uh, he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. I often wondered about that. You know, I literally love evangelism, and that's important. And But the concept of the Messiah is very challenging, not only to these folks, but to we as well. You know, when we think of the Messiah, we think of all different things, and all different kinds of Messiah. They thought of him as a military leader or a healer. They thought of him as a, who could do prophecy. They thought of all kinds of things. But that's not what he's saying here. Who do you say, in a personal way, that I am? Who do you say that your life can be changed? Who do you say that indeed Jesus is when people come and ask you about not only the church, but about you? And that's important. Because someone out there will see your life. Someone out there will see what you're doing. Someone out there will want to know who is your Lord and who is your Savior. That's what evangelism is about. We live in a culture that somehow is able to ignore Christ. We live in a culture that people don't want to hear really about Christ. They want to know about him, but not who he really is, because he can, he will change your life and make you something exciting, make you something different, make you something very, very different as well. It's important that you do that, and you need to step beyond that. You need to step into that personal confession and profess, and, and profess the power of Christ. Profess that power that makes a difference. That somehow that rules our lives. So, what kind of Christ are you professing? What are you doing to make a difference in people's lives? But what are you doing in your life? What are these things doing? And it's important. Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And that must have been very powerful. Peter had all kinds of issues and, and uh, did different things, but they made a difference. They made a difference in his life, and he professed that to other people. <clears throat> and it's important we know that. Not who do you know, Jesus, but he, not who do you know about Jesus, but who do you know Jesus? As I said before, I think 
America is ready for a revival. Down in uh, uh, Whitmore, Kentucky, at Ashbury University, uh, they've had this revival going on for a couple of weeks. My granddaughter went down and uh, saw what was going on and reported back. I haven't got the report yet, but she's that type of young lady. And she wants to know what the difference is. And I think we all need to know that. We have to allow the Spirit to do those types of things. Now, I don't know what kind of revival this will be, but I hope it's long-lasting. And I hope it's a type of revival <clears throat> that makes a difference, not only in that university, but right here in our community as well. So I would if, uh, go on YouTube and check it out. Uh, they have some pictures of it, and they let you know what's going on, but it's important. There are other people making a difference. There are other people trying to make a difference politically and socially and emotionally. And uh, it's kind of important to know that. One of the things that we're doing in the West Virginia Baptist Convention is looking at mental health. Mental health of our children. The mental health of our young adults. That is so important. If you just take a moment and look around. If you just take a moment and see what's going on in your culture and try to figure out how you can make a difference. You can make a difference by being aware of this. Being aware that people need help. People need the Lord. And that hasn't changed. We need to be changing that in this culture. It's kind of interesting. Several years ago, not several years ago, but a few years ago, Ben Carlson, um, he ran for president of the United States. I think it was 2016. And um, uh, he, was, he was an interesting guy. I read a lot about him. And in the foreword, he said, we have a painful past, a confusing present, but a hopeful future. Isn't that exciting? Yes, we do have a painful past. I don't understand all the racial ramifications of things, and I probably never will. But I do understand it's painful. I do understand every time you turn on the television, someone shot someone else. I do understand that we keep making social mistakes, and we get ourselves in social dilemmas, and we have a confusing presence. You know, it seems like the... The, the law profession cannot make up its mind. You go to one state and they do one thing, you go to another state and they do something else, and that's confusing to me. I'm an old person, and it's kind of important to understand that. It's kind of important that it's confusing. But the last thing he closes out with in his book is a hopeful future. We have hope. And if all things fail, we have hope. His uh, book was entitled uh, Created Equal. If you get a chance, it's not a very long book. Uh, you can check it out or pick it up or read it online. But it just reminds us that we do have a chance to make a difference. When you know who Christ is. Not about him, but who he really is. So I challenge you today. Do you know who Christ is? Are you allowing him to make a difference in your life? I like this scripture because it says, but who do you say that I am. You know who that you is? You. Who do you say that I am? And that's important. Today in your prayer life, I hope you pray and ask God to, to bless not only this revival, but bless us. That we might have a revival. Bless us that we might renew. Bless us that we might understand the importance of making a difference in this community at this particular time. I was uh, I always go through the channels on Sunday morning. I always uh, check out everything. And I was uh, looking at First Baptist Church of Dallas. My daughter lives, our daughter lives in Dallas. She doesn't go to that church, but she lives there. And I like to see what the preachers are preaching. And uh, one of the guys said today, we don't know when Jesus is coming, but we do know he's coming. And we need to be ready. And I think every week we need to understand that and preach that in all our churches that Christ is coming and we need to be ready. Christ is coming and we need to understand who he is. Who do you say that Christ is? You have to decide that for yourself and you have to make a difference. May we make a difference? Can we make a difference right now? Can we make a difference today when we go home? Can we make a difference when we go to lunch? Can we make a difference? If you feel you can't, you've missed the point of the gospel. 
The point of the gospel is you can be changed. And I think that's exciting. I don't know about the rest of you. I like to be changed. Because I know there's a lot of things in my life just aren't right. And I need to make sure they're right. We never can sit around and be satisfied with who we are. But we need to be changed. And that change is a good thing. So today I would simply ask you, do you know about Jesus? Oh, I know we do a great job here with Sunday school and different groups. I think that's knowing about Jesus. But do you know Jesus? Do you really know who he is? Have you invited him to your life to make a difference? Have you invited him to your heart to make a difference? That's the challenge of today. And that will be the challenge until he comes. And I would hope when Troy comes back to preach, he'll say, what happened to this congregation? There's some people here that really want to know more and more about Christ. You need to do that. I find things every day I don't know. <clears throat> and uh, that's nothing unusual for me. Uh, I just keep deciding that I'm not getting older, I'm getting dumber. And uh, it's kind of important that we do the evangelism where we need to, to be called to do. But it's not about me. It's not about Troy. It's about you. You're the one that has to go out and tell and show people about Christ. Several years ago, there was a lady, Mrs. Ciccarelli, from Clarksburg. And she was a mother of uh, Joy Payton, which was a member. And she was gotten in a terrible situation in her hands and burned both of them. So the ambulance took her to Morgantown because her hands looked like they were destroyed. While she was going to Morgantown, she made sure that both of the ambulance attendants were saved. Even during her time of pain, even the time of loss, I don't know if she ever lost the use of her hands, she made sure that they knew who Jesus was. In your time of pain, in your time of loss, in your time of uncertainty, do you know who Jesus is? Are you making a difference in other people's life? I pray so. Because in doing that, you'll make a big difference. I would invite you, <clears throat> if you really want to know about Jesus and changing people's lives, I invite you to do that. I can also invite you to go down to Hope Center and uh, see a bunch of guys. Boy, are they loud. Boy, do they have fun. And they have just kind of become part of Janie and I's family. That's important. What family are you a part of? How is this church making a part in something like that? See, if everyone would just do something, we can make a difference. Just don't settle idly by. Make sure you understand that you can make a difference. You maybe can only go down there one day for a Bible study. Or you can buy First Baptist Church and see what's going on there. But you know what's most important? That you apply that here. That something exciting can happen here. And lives can be changed. Pray with me, please. <clears throat> Father God, send a blessing on us now. And may these words go out and return on that you bless. That indeed we know who you are and we know what you're doing. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this blessed opportunity. Thank you for the word of God, and thank you that we can make a difference. Father God, you are a good God all the time, and help us to understand it's not about who we are, but who you are. It's not about what we can become, but how you can make us different. Now be with us. If there's someone here in the sound of my voice that wants to invite you into their heart, we give them that invitation. It's not an exciting one, it's not a broad one, but it is a life-changing one. It can change your life. And may your grace be sufficient as we close our service. Because as we close our service, we open the doors to heaven. May people hear the word and respond to your love and glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Appreciate that message, and uh, I think it's, it's so true that, that we all have such an ability to, to make an impact in the kingdom, and uh, 
Uh, if you guys remember, you as you leave through these doors right here, right here outside the sanctuary, above them, it says you're now entering the mission field. Uh, because that's, that's where the mission field exists, is outside of this building. And we have such an ability and an opportunity to, to, to reach so many people uh, for the glory of God. So our final hymn this morning is uh, Amazing Grace. And uh, if you all want to sing along with us, uh, stand and sing. If you want to come to the front to pray, uh, myself or Dr. Perico, if you 